This is stuff you like and I do not like the Da Vinci Code. I mean, I read it once and thought it was a pretty zippy book. The writing quality didn't really bother me and the pacing was fast, so it was you know, entertaining enough. Plus, I do like puzzles, and we got to take a nice kind of virtual tour of Paris. But boy oh boy, if you know anything about Christianity, church history, the Renaissance, logic, the code mentioned in the title will drive you to despair. Did you know that there's an amazing new theory rocking the world of flat earthers? Did you know that there was a world of flat earthers that was there to be rocked? There was this YouTube video published not so long ago entitled No Forests on Flat Earth. The theory hypothesizes that the trees and forests that we see on our Earth today are in fact mere pale imitations of the giant trees that used to inhabit this flat Earth of ours, before being cruelly cut down by giants with very large chainsaws? I'm not really sure. And the reason I bring it up is that the Flat Earth Society is an excellent example of motivated reasoning. Religious belief, or no religious belief, may depend on motivated reasoning, but there's no way to prove the existence or non-existence of a god or gods. How would you even do that? But it is reasonably easy to prove that the world is roughly spherical. We can go into space and orbit the Earth. We can see the curve of the horizon from a very tall mountain or when we go up in a plane. The ancient Greeks figured out that the Earth wasn't flat by observing how ships disappeared over the horizon. But if you believe that the Earth is flat, then you can also believe in a massive conspiracy to cover up the truth. I'm not sure why you'd want to cover up the shape of the Earth, regardless of what that shape is, but there we go. The important thing is that motivated reasoning says your argument has a tiny logical flaw and is thus fundamentally unsound, but my argument is fundamentally sound and thus any minor logical flaws don't matter. Watching the Da Vinci Code is a little like how I imagine a meeting of the Flat Earth Society. There is a massive secret being kept from humanity which would rock the foundations of the world because... because... well it just would, okay? The plot of the Da Vinci Code the movie, for clarity, goeth thusly. Robert Langdon is a professor of religious symbology at Harvard. While lecturing in Paris, he's supposed to meet a dude for drinks who never shows up. Turns out he was murdered and left himself in a weird Vitruvian man pose to provide clues to solve his murder. Langdon is a suspect, but is told by Sophie, cryptographer and granddaughter of the murdered man, that he needs to bust out of there and solve this case with her. And so he does. Turns out Saunier was the Grand Master of the Priory of Sion, who protect the source of God or the church's power on earth. Which is the holy grail, which is the bloodline of Jesus and not a cup. And they have to compete with Opus Dei, who are also trying to find the bloodline so they can end it, and with the police in order to find it. And solve the clues left by Saunier with a little help from the truth revealed by Leonardo da Vinci in his paintings because he was a former Grand Master of the Priory of Sion, who are totally not a hoax orchestrated by a group of proto-trolls in the mid-20th century. Ho oh no, they were a real thing, honest. That the Priory of Sion is a hoax is just what they want you to think. And it turns out Sir Ian McKellen has been orchestrating the whole thing to find the grail, and in the end, surprise! Sophie is the last remaining descendant of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene is buried under the glass pyramids at the Louvre. And maybe Robert has an intense spiritual moment. That was what happened in the book, anyway. The end. Oh boy, where to start. The Da Vinci Code's dubious grasp of history is largely down to its source material, things like Holy Blood, Holy Grail, for example. I mean, it's totally fine to use pseudo-historical sources for your fictional novel, Dan Brown, but maybe better not to claim at the start of it that it's totally real and true, all of it very well researched. Yes, yes it is. Although doing so means Tony Robinson ends up getting a job making BBC miniseries about how all of the claims in your book are rubbish, so I guess you're providing him with some work. From the Gospel of Mary Magdalene herself. No. What about that figure on the right hand of our Lord? That's a dude. Constantine held a famous ecumenical gathering known as the Council of Nicaea. Oh, that's actually right. The prostitute? She was no such thing. Correct, well done. Smeared by the church in 591 Anno Domino Pud. Never ascribe to slander what can accurately be ascribed to 20% of Judean women in the first century having the same name. Jesus was mortal one day and divine the next. You have no idea what first century Arianism actually is, do you? The matter of Jesus' divinity was not actually in question at the Council of Nicaea. The matter in question was whether Jesus was begotten by the Father and thus had always existed, or if Jesus' divinity was conferred to him by God the father who had created him out of nothing. The former belief won out, by the way, but neither position argued that Jesus was not divine. Honestly, do your research. You can find this out on Wikipedia. The book and the movie both dig into the Gnostic gospel, 
disciples and claim that they thought that Jesus was just a man. No, that is the exact opposite of what the Gnostics thought. The Gnostics thought that Jesus had no human body, it was illusory, and that he was pure spirit because, ugh, who'd want an icky, gross human body? Ugh. But if you really wanted to learn about Gnosticism or the Council of Nicaea or the historicity of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, yeah, there are other places you can do that. Right. So back on topic. Because all this griping aside, Dan Brown is an author of fiction. He writes fictional things, which are not true. Making stuff up is kind of his stock and trade. But oh wow, this was a definite thing when the book first came out, and then again when the movie came out. The church universally derided it as abject nonsense. Some even developed courses using the Da Vinci Code as a jumping off point to talk about the historicity of the Gospels and Jesus and Christianity and all of that stuff, so... bonus? I mean, it's nice to know we can still agree on some things. But really, Dan Brown, you can't claim that you've done all of this very careful research and then say stuff which is either dubious, like the stuff about the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, or just factually inaccurate, like the stuff about the Last Supper and Da Vinci. But it is a tempting conspiracy theory. The idea that there is a secret about the sacred feminine which has been hidden from the rest of the world, but you, you know what's up, because you are special. And given the church's somewhat dodgy history as regards women, even more tempting. If you're going to make up stuff for your work of fiction, that's totally fine, but it would be nice if it at least kinda made sense. Because as it stands, it goes, the source of the church's power on earth is the fact that nobody knows that Jesus was just a regular dude and that he was married to Mary Magdalene and that they had a kid. Also, she's the sacred feminine or something. Because no divine entity in the mythologies of anywhere ever has ever, ever had sex with a human and produced offspring. And obviously the church doesn't believe that Jesus was fully human and so he couldn't have gotten married and had a, a wit. Once again, it was the Gnostics who thought that Jesus was entirely spirit. Logically, Jesus being married or not married does not change the fact of whether or not he was divine. And if your argument here is that he wasn't divine, then that's fine. But then why is his wife the sacred feminine? Why do his offspring have quasi-magical powers? Why would you then kneel at the tomb of Mary Magdalene, who isn't a goddess, she's just a normal lady? Like, there's no reason to assume that Mary Magdalene is a goddess. If Jesus is just a regular dude, then surely she is just a regular woman. And even if Jesus was a god or divine or whatever, having sex with someone does not transfer divinity to them. And if your argument is Jesus had a baby and the church hid the truth, why? Why? This is never adequately explained. And again, if Jesus isn't divine, then why do his descendants have quasi-magical powers? Maybe he's a mutant. Ooh, maybe he's Wolverine. But why? Why do we believe conspiracy theories? Why would we believe this incredible collection of illogical what? I guess the question is, why does anyone believe anything that's a bit out there? Why do people believe in religions? Why do people believe in conspiracy theories? Why do people believe in, I don't know, string theory, homeopathy, vaccinations, anti-vax? the science of cow pats. And yes, I know obviously all of those are not considered equally wacky or out there, but that's kind of my point. How do we decide whether or not to believe something? Well, when we're young, we tend to believe everything, even when those things are mutually contradictory because our critical reasoning faculties aren't really brilliant. But as we get older and our reasoning abilities improve, there are two different processes which go on when we hear something, depending on whether or not we want to believe it. Depending on whether or not it fits in with the collection of beliefs that we have already achieved. Can I believe it? Or must I believe it? The part of your brain that believes or disbelieves information kicks in before your logical reasoning processes. So first you believe or disbelieve, and then the rationalization happens. It takes either a complete disinterest in the outcome, I don't care if X or Y is better, or a concerted mental effort, I'm gonna try very hard not to let my preconceived ideas affect this, in order to even partially combat our need to believe or disbelieve something first and then figure out why. We are pattern-seeking machines and we go with our gut more times than not. If we want to believe something, can I believe this? If we don't, must I believe this? If we want something to be true, if we believe in the inherent suspiciousness of, say, the Catholic Church or large pharmaceutical corporations or Donald Trump, then anything which confirms our belief that they are inherently shady must, in fact, be the case. There is obviously a ridiculousness threshold, but depending on how strong your belief is, that can be quite high. If, on the other hand, we believe something that is called into question by new evidence, like a study showing that vaccines are safe, or pictures from the International Space Station, or from Mars or something. Then we ask ourselves, must I believe it? And so we comb it for justification like minor methodological flaws or 
conspiracy theories. Everybody wants to be special and everybody wants to be right, and that, my friends, is how you get conspiracy. So you can probably find someone somewhere who believes the Da Vinci Code is an important work of fiction with deeply factual roots in the real Priory of Sion and etc etc holy grail whatever. I mean, I have seen the curve of the earth from planes and yet the Flat Earth Society still exists. Thanks for watching this episode of Stuff You Like, I hope you enjoy me ranting about daft things. If you want to support the show then you can go to the Patreon link which is near my face. If you want to leave a comment do please tell me what you thought of the Da Vinci Code but also Tom Hanks's really weird haircut. And regardless, I will see you next time.